Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB Advanced Technical Test Analyst. We are in chapter 3 and we have covered all the topics of chapter 3 so far and in this tutorial we are going to continue with the, the sample questions on the chapter 3. But before that let me make a quick announcement that is going to be a little lengthy as we are talking about the advanced level questions and that involves a lot of analysis and typically when you talk about the chapter 3 it involves your complete engagement in order to respond and to understand a right answer it requires equally importantly the right justification in order to accept and grab the information which would be required in order to do the similar thing during the examination so yes this tutorial is quite long but it's going to help you understand each and every concept of the sample questions from the technical test analyst yes the very first thing here we are talking about is exam pattern like what kind of question or what number of questions you will be expecting here so if you see right now on the screen chapter 3 consists of seven mandatory questions where uh, uh, most of them like number four number four questions uh, actually five yeah uh, six questions in fact I'm just getting confused here like I have to count three plus one plus one and plus one so we have six questions which are at k3 and one from uh, 3.2.4 that is at k2 so you have six k3 questions and one k2 question from from this chapter putting together seven mandatory questions let's get into the sample questions from this chapter and start exploring a little more the very first thing here we are taking is a pseudo code in order to understand from the static analysis and maintenance of the code so yes so this is how we try to do the static analysis in order to understand that how we can realize where exactly the code is going wrong so here is a pseudo code for a tricky program we just named it like named the program as tricky and it's a pseudo code so please do not look forward to start evaluating for syntax and say that this code is non-executable and so it's just that a pseudo code you just have to understand the architecture control flow and then evaluate the answer that's all so which of the following statement about the tricky program most correctly describes any control flow anomalies in it so first of all team you need to go through the program once before you look at the options because options sometimes may be a little crazy in order to divert you so very first thing is you do before looking at the option that at least understand the program that what is it written if there is anything which you can actually find before looking at the option that would be really interesting to get the right answer through but yes let's start looking at the program and then I don't want to take it longer so I'm not gonna read the program exactly but let me help you with the justification on the right answer here and evaluate the options number a says tricky program contains no control flow anomalies uh, probably true until unless we find something b the tricky program contains unreachable code and infinite loop so that's a problem which we should look forward to c the tricky program contains unreachable code that's another thing which is quite similar so b or c uh, any one of that could be true so you need to concentrate on both of them and d the tricky program contains a loop with multiple entry points so why i'm looking at the options here in order to derive because that filters your point to avoid unwanted uh, analysis of a code for the examination point of view now examination point of view the options will clearly tell you what are the areas which you need to concentrate on and you can minimize your effort in order to find the right answer so a is saying that there is no anomaly so for that option you don't have to look at the program so eliminate that straight away d says is there a multiple entry point so let's look here in the program do you see that there is a multiple entry point no there's only one which says begin on the top and has declaration of three variables and an integer which as integer and then if you continue further there are loops but uh, there's no multiple entry point so d is also eliminated now we are left with b and c now half of your job is done and now what you have to look for is two things is there an unreachable code or is there an infinite loop so it is just that unreachable code anyhow will be there in this program because b and c both has that so one is sure that you have an unreachable code here all you have to look for is an infinite loop of course it will fulfill that because if there is unreachable code then obviously something is there as infinite loop in order to avoid reaching to the unreachable code 
So I think we, without looking at the program, we really got the answer here for this, that is, could be B. But still, let me tell you why the answer could be B. So let's start from the top that we have three variables. Begin, read the variable two, read the variable one. That's your inputs. So you may declare anything as a you know, variable two value and variable one value, which is user defined. And then while variable two is less than 10, loop it. So it's going to continue there as a loop subjected it is less than 10. Now, I mean, imagine that you have any value which is less than 10. Then where three is equal to where two plus one, which you have already provided. So say that it's just like, you know, two plus one, so you get three. So where three is equal to three. Now where two is static, it says is equal to four. So three plus four is seven. Now where one is, is equal to where two plus one, where where two is four, which is fixed and plus one, which is five. So no matter what values you have put, at the end of the day, the var one by default will always reach number five because var two is static. It's fixed there, hard coded that it will be four and var one is equal to var two plus one. So now if you look at the line number 10, if var is equal to five, that means this is the place where the value of var one will always be five, no matter what you put. And then the line number 13 will never be reached or it will not be ever executed. That means the loop will continue, the while loop will continue for infinite times and var plus one printing line number 13 will never be reachable. And that's where we find out the right answer is B, which says the tricky program contains unreachable code and infinite loop. But you need to remember the shortcut which I gave you to eliminate certain options and then come up with the outcome and put some logic there to pick up the right answer even if you don't look at the program. That's very interesting to remember if you can. Look at the next number, that is question number two. You have been provided with the following system wide average measures for the four systems which could be anything like W, X, Y, Z. And there's a data provided to you from the point of cyclomatic complexity, cohesion, coupling, uh, commented code, uh, repeated code instance. And now we have provided with the statistics of uh, different systems on these parameters. What we are looking at is budget is available to improve the maintainability of the code in each of the four system by applying the result of static analysis to the individual components. Which of the following is the best application at static analysis if only two measures are um, per system can be resourced. That means you are allocated with a budget, but only two things or two measures or two parameters can be considered for any system. Now, the most important thing is start analyzing the data here for each one of them and start filtering what would be more important for any particular system to be addressed at that point of time when you have some budget. So starting from the top view here on the top, no, you, this time you don't have to look at the options, okay? Because that's very crazy and uh, can divert you and keep you engaged for a long time. So start evaluating from the table that W, cyclomagnetic complexity is the highest. That means the other has eight, 12, seven, but this has 23. Now, if you're talking about something more than 10 or 12, or probably just more than 10, it's just like exhaustive testing. And cyclomagnetic complexity, you should not forget that. It is a test technique in order to reduce the uh, number of test cases when required to execute or prepare test cases. So it's having 23, there's no point using cyclomagnetic complexity. So that's the area of interest for you to address. And when you talk about uh, the repeated code instance for W is nine, which is again, the important area of concern as we look into the, uh, the cohesion and uh, the repeatability, nine or more is suggested is worth addressing. So if you have anything more than nine or equal to nine, repeated code instance is actually considered as high. So that's your threshold and you do consider these parameters. So one is CC and RE. Okay, let us not consider only this. Probably you got the right answer there that C has this option, but what if that could be wrong because we do have 12 for Z. So let's see if that fulfills. Then we come to X, it says, uh, uh, Cyclomatic complexity is eight, that's fine. Coupling is high. 
and we have to look forward to reduce that as a high will be considered as area of addressing very highly coupled and could be complex and uh, cohesion is medium that's uh, fine but commented code is just 10 percent 10 percent is an inter area of interest that only 10 percent of the part is commented and rest all is uncommented and that could be a probable reason for you to address that and add more comments to it Similarly, Y uh, includes the cyclometric complexity, which is higher than 10. So area of interest for you to explore more about that. And cohesion is low. Remember team, uh, when uh, coupling is high, you consider that for addressing. Cohesion is like connectivity is low, then you need to look into that, the why we have low connectivity, or we don't have proper connectivity between the modules. So that is another thing. And then for Z, of course, uh, we have uh, the cohesion or the sorry, the commented code is 8%, which is quite low. And we need to look into that. And the second part is uh, repeated code instances, that is RE, which is 12 and more than 9, of course. So that is also equally measured. So, But the best thing what you see during this observation is W and Z. Uh, both have repeated code instances high, like 9 and 12. So the right option is already given to you based on that analysis. So you just pick up the right answer as C, where W says CC and RE, X says CP and CO, Y says CC and CH, and Z says CO and RE. And that would be your right answer there. Let's look at the next question here. Which of the following is a way to use call graphs to determine integration testing requirements? Now, first of all, you need to understand what is call graphs and recall the information what you learned there and then obviously related with integration testing requirement. And anyways, call graphs will be useful for that. A, establishing the number of locations within the software from a method or function is called. That's good. B, establishing the number of locations within the software from where a module or system is called. Now, just a slight difference. If you don't read the options carefully, you may probably pick any one of these. But you might wonder sometime that they both sound similar. But no, there's a big difference between method or function and when you say module or system. C, uh, determining conditional and unconditional call for the performance analysis. And D, detecting areas to be targeted for the possible memory leaks. Now, first of all, start eliminating whenever you get stuck with something. When you say uh, the call graphs are helpful in actually determining what should be uh, done in order to understand how the modules are being called. The call graphs is all about that. But if you look at D, it is talking about memory leak, which is not done by the call graphs. That's dynamic analysis. So D is straightforward, eliminated. And uh, C is equally, you know, same like determining conditional or con unconditional call can be used for integration. But using them for performance analysis has nothing to do with the integration. So be it, don't forget that there is a level also provided to you in the question that is integration testing. And here they clearly say C is performance analysis. Now you're completely left with two options A and B. And now you don't have to put anything as an effort to get the right answer because call graphs is not for method and function. It is for a module calling structure to see that how a module A is connected to module B, C, D, E, and so on. So module or system is what is the basis for us to create the call graphs to show the calling structure of that. So here, the right answer is B, establishing the number of locations within the software from, a from where a module or system is called. Let's look at the last question of this episode and this tutorial. Uh, Number four, you are the technical test analyst working on a project developing a new ambulance dispatch system. Could be anything. This ADS uh, assists operators in taking calls about incidents, identifying available ambulance, and mobilizing ambulance to handle the incidents. You know that the ADS was designed using an object-oriented approach and implemented using a language with automated garbage collection. During system and acceptance testing, the system has been perceived to be generally performing correctly, but also rather slightly slow. And it has also occasionally crashed, that's an area of concern. The subsequent brief investigation were inconclusive, as it was just brief, you could not conclude anything out of it. 
Which of the following statement would best justify the use of dynamic analysis in this situation? So all we need to understand that how in this scenario when system is responding slowly, uh, one thing is that we are talking about memory leaks here, and the second thing is of course it is crashing at some point of time, probably the memory is not released at all, and then it has crashed, but you didn't have detailed information, so you could not conclude. So what is that best thing you can do to justify that how dynamic analysis will be helpful for you to handle this situation. So just to start looking at the option and uh, start evaluating them with your understanding. So here the very first option what we have is to understand from the dynamic analysis point of view. That is A, dynamic analysis could be used to measure response times for various function to subsequently allow system tuning. Now, dynamic analysis is not typically used for measuring response times. That For that, we have the performance testing tools, whereas dynamic analysis is more about diagnosing it, finding out the root causes, finding out the area where the reason or the root cause lies. And thus, that cannot be one of the reasons to select as the best option. B, dynamic analysis could be used to generate call graphs of the system to allow targeted performance enhancements. And I think call graphs are generated by static analysis. We covered that in the previous topic, not in the dynamic analysis. So again, that's not applicable at all. C, dynamic analysis could identify memory access violations caused by a wild pointer that result in the occasional crashes. Now that's something which is, which is uh, very important, which you covered as a part of dynamic analysis tutorials, that's detecting wild pointers is possible when you have dynamic analysis into practice. So that seems to be most relevant. Subjected, you validate the D. D says dynamic analysis could be used to determine if defects introduced by programmers failing to release allocated memory are causing the crashes. Now that's again interesting, but the scenario tells us that automated garbage collection was used, so it is unlikely that programmers will need to release the memory. So may also be since memory leaks usually cause performance degradation and ultimately out of resource error from the OS side. So this is where we can say that it's not actually that uh, dynamic analysis will be or you know the, the garbage collector is a part of the scenario so programming programmers failed to release the memory so it's more of like probably we have left something which is no longer required to be used in the program and function and still it is pointing to certain areas and allocating the memory so the right answer here is dynamic analysis could identify memory access violation caused by a wild pointer that results in occasional crash and that is C so I hope that was quite interesting to all of you and had really good justification in order to understand. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. Uh, look forward to have more videos coming up on the chapter four soon. And uh, till then, keep learning, keep exploring and keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.